ladies and gentlemen, welcome in. I hello, I'm your host, Robbie C. And today I actually am flying solo in the booth. And I'll go ahead and let you, I'll bring you inside. You know, we're all about, I say, I've said it before, I'll say it a million times. I love bringing you guys behind the scenes of what we do here uh, with podcasts. I, according to my wife, I don't overshare, uh, but I can't even disagree with her if I'm being honest. I, I absolutely am an overshare. But today, AVB is not in the house. And the reason AVB is not in the house is because he he texted me and said, hey, I'm going to be out for PTO on Thursday when we normally record. Uh, just wanted to see what your opinion are. Like, what are we planning for the podcast this week? And I had a couple people that I had been trying to line up for guest spot opportunities. Uh, but one of the big things that I like to push is, you know, when you're on vacation, be on vacation. And Brad is such a giver, uh, and really so dedicated to y'all as an audience that Brad, like almost every time Brad's gone on vacation, there's a reason that Brad, I don't think has really ever missed an episode, uh, is because even when that man's on vacation, he is all business Brad. And so he wants to get out here and be with you guys and record the podcast. But I tried to be like, Hey, take the time, take the PTO. I'll take care of the podcast this week. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of the podcast this week. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't realize at the time, so my calendar now, but it's Brad's birthday today. So, uh, I want you guys to head to the comments, wish ABB a happy birthday, uh, his birthday. So we wanted to make sure that we took care of it. Uh, so getting that out on the top side, please, please, please head to the comments, head to his Instagram, comment on everything. Happy birthday. Uh, you guys are going to be seeing this a day after his birthday. His birthday is, uh, this Thursday, like I said. Uh, so make sure you go show him some love. I'm super grateful for Brad, everything he does for foundation, for Atlas and for this podcast, um, wouldn't be possible without him. So thank you so much, Brad, for everything you do. I hope it has been an incredible birthday, uh, with the family. And, uh, we look forward to having you back on the podcast next week. Uh, but I wanted to, we didn't want to just have me ramble for a little while. So I reached out to a friend who is on the disc golf pro tour. And I said, Hey, it's been a bit, uh, we chatted. I've met him in person several times. Uh, got to know him that way. Uh, and he is just a stand up human being, uh, really, really grateful for him. Uh, and just, I think he brings a lot to the table, but he's not a pro tour name that you may be familiar with for the pro tour, but you might know his name if you watch certain content creators. And so, but I, I joked with him when I saw him at the Northeast Disc Golf Expo this past year, uh, or 2024. Yeah, when I saw him there, because he was walking around with another Pro Tour player. And I said, everyone's fawning over this guy, but they don't realize that we have a major champion standing right here with us. So today's guest, a major champion on the disc golf or not sorry 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 he is a major champion it, it's not a stretch he is a major champion on the disc golf pro tour but he's not because he won a major on the pro tour if that makes sense you know what i'm just gonna stop rambling i want to introduce you to today's guest paul kranz and before i get more tongue-tied we're gonna bring him in paul's an incredible human being and i can't wait for you guys to get to know paul let's dive in Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the podcast, Mr. Paul Kranz. Paul, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fantastic. Dude, Paul, yeah. it is it is a pleasure to have you on here, man. Uh, I'm flying solo today, so excited to have you uh, come hang out and chat. I got to meet Paul at the Northeast Disc Golf Expo two years ago. We got to meet, uh, and they got to tag up again last year, uh, or I guess this year uh, is the better yeah. way to put it. Um, but Paul, uh, I introduced you as a major champion so uh i'm i'm excited for this i i like to even when we talked in person at northeast disc Self this year uh you were welcome with simon people were you know all chat with him and i was like wow all these lamos don't even realize that there's a major champion standing right next to him and yeah, there's moving right. past that so uh tell us your major title and tell us a little bit about your history uh of disc golf how long have you been playing things like that uh, so I won Amateur Worlds back in 2022, and uh, that was my first legit tournament year, I would say. Um, I started playing July 2019, so it's been a little over four years now, getting close, getting close to five years. 
Um, so definitely uh, have not had the most experience in golf, but I've made the most of it with a lot of practice. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just uh, found this off through a group of Ultimate Frisbee players. Uh, a good friend invited me, and then like a month later, the guy who ran it uh, brought some discs. And I asked if I could borrow a few, and he said, sure. I'm pretty sure my first putter was a JK Pro AVR. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And in the Northeast, so like you're, you're in the mass area. Um, so I always like down here in the South, JK AVRs for 10 months out of the year, they feel almost like <laughs> rubbery because they're so floppy. Is yeah. that sort of like, are they a little stiffer up there because they're getting so much colder for y'all or are they still most, pretty floppy? Most of the year they would be, uh, yeah, they would be kind of stiff, but when I got them, it was like 90 degrees. Uh, <laughs> so super floppy. I love it. Yeah. Um, sick. Well, uh, we have you, you start playing four or five years ago. So we want the, we want our players to get to know you because, uh, for those who don't know Paul's name, uh, I would say most famously where you probably, you should know him is from his AM world title, uh, because it, Truly, that was the year it came down. Y'all went into a playoff for the win, right? No, that that was at U.S. Amateurs. U.S. Amateurs. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. But same year, uh, two okay. weeks later. Same Wild. Wild. Yeah. First first full tournament you're playing, and you end up in a finals for like a push for two huge titles. That yeah. is insane, dude. Insane. Yeah. Um. So, uh, where you should know him is for these things, uh, but some of you will know him from Simon's vlogs uh, and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, but we'll talk about that later on during the podcast. You know, got to give some people uh, other reasons to stick around, things like that. But we want them to get to know you as a player because you currently are on the pro tour. Uh, do you have you have a full card, right? Yeah, I got I got the full card through an exemption. Okay, so uh, that is incredible uh first off so we have a pro tour player with us ladies and gentlemen and we ask these questions paul for people to get to know our guests normally because we're going to be like breaking down their bag and so yeah. it kind of gives context for oh you have a uh and you have an insanity in your bag okay well if we yeah. know your game we're going to learn how that insanity should fly for you or things yeah. like that as opposed to when you describe how it flies uh so for them to get to know your game a little bit on a pro tour level player, a, a major champion level, uh, I'm going to keep pushing this because I just, I, I <laughs> believe uh, that that is a huge accomplishment and I think everyone should. So uh, I want to give credit where it's due, sir. Um, Appreciate it. But we, so we put you in a field and we said, all right, Paul, we're going to put a basket X amount of feet away from you. How far do you feel like you can consistently reach that back, that basket? Um, not saying like with the tailwind downhill, this is my max distance, but like golf lines, you're saying I can reach this basket on a backhand and a forehand. Uh, are we talking like circle one accuracy or just distance wise? Uh, I would say you can give us both. You can give us both because I think that's an important distinction, especially for tour players. All right. I would say circle one would be 425 feet and that would be hyzer. Uh, okay. So and then like a bit more technical distance shot would be not not counting circle one would probably be like four four seventy. Okay. So I, I don't throw I don't throw farther than five hundred feet, but I can throw accurately below five hundred feet. Like I can throw hyzers four fifty every now and again. Depends on the day. Depends on yeah. the body shape. But yeah, but it, like you would think if I can throw a Heiser 450 that I can throw a distance shot 600. No, not even close. I, I don't know. I, I, I've trained my disc golf game to be more accurate shots. So I, I've never really clicked with that like farther distance. Yeah. So that, that, was, that was my follow up was so a lot of people, do you feel like that? There are folks, obviously, that you see them enter the distance competitions and things like that. And it's almost, it's like 
do you feel like it's two very different skills the like just trying to go raw distance versus accurate distance yeah 100 percent. because i on the pro tour i outdrive a ton of players more than more than you would think especially for my body stature and how long i've been playing i outdrive a lot of players but when it put us in a field and they'll out throw me by 150 feet easily fascinating fascinating yeah. So um, if you if you were working with someone, would you would you advise them to take your route? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, I've been playing for five years and I made it on Pro Tour pretty quick. Um, just with my style of game. Although if you're trying to make it on the Pro Tour, if you're trying to make it on the Pro Tour, I would say uh, you you'd want more distance in your game. That's one thing that I've learned, but at the same time, you just need to like get the Joey Buckets route and make what you have work, and clearly what he has works. Um, I I haven't quite figured out that mental side of it. Um, I get these pro tour courses, and I think they're harder than the they are. So then I tweak my game a bit. But this past weekend, I learned that I don't need to. Um, I. I can throw farther if I want to. There's one shot this past weekend where I was trying to throw 470 feet, but I threw 425 feet, or sorry, 525 feet uh, to a better spot than I was expecting. So I would say depends on how dial I am. Okay. Just, yeah. So p- keeping that keeping that idea going of – uh, if you wanted to get on tour, you had to do that. I know, I feel like some people have different answers, but this is your first full year on tour. Uh, and so if someone was, cause we have like Bedanza is documenting his journey, trying to get on the tour, mm-hmm. trying to get a card. Um, and I feel like he's asked a couple people and that answer kind of shifts. So for the viewer at home, when you're watching these pro tour courses, it's just, so difficult to grasp how far people are actually throwing right because for y'all a 400 foot hyzer can look rather stock yeah but for us obviously just a 400 foot shot in general does not look stock at all uh so we it almost you guys make it look too easy at times so the (laughs) the difficulty doesn't transfer um so if you were to tell someone like If you're looking to go make it, if you want to get a tour card and cash on tour, how far would you say on both sides, like forehand and backhand, you probably need to have in the repertoire to even consider like pushing those courses? Um, I would say a 350 foot forehand, but that would be more stock angle, like straight highs or, um, but you really don't need more than 350. And then uh, backhand, probably 450 stock angles. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would say I would say you rarely need to throw more than four, 450 on any hole. Because most of the par threes that are over 450, they're downhill. And if they're not, then that's just ridiculous. But yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say not as far as you would think. Almost any, almost anyone who has the dedication could uh, could get the and throw their shots. Okay, that's that is that is positive to know. I like that. Now, one area that I do think that people hold themselves to a pro tour standard when they shouldn't is especially is the putting green. Like I will be, I'll get to round two, uh, you know, we'll be sitting at lunch between a two day, like a two around one day event, a little seat here in town and I'll have an MA3 player tell me like, oh man, yeah, no, I missed one circle putt, like one circle one putt today. <laughs> like, what am I doing? And I'm like, you're an MA3, my man. That's okay. <laughs> like, that's perfectly acceptable. Right. It's a little different than being on the pro tour. So for you, one of the questions we ask on the putting green is, all right, Paul, we put you on the putting green. You got 10 putts from 15 feet, 10 putts from 25 feet, and 10 putts from 40 feet. How many are you expecting to make at each station? Uh, 10 out of 10 from 15. 
If you miss any of those, you just <laughs> stepped up. <Tough>. And, <laughs> st- stepped up and just grip locked it or something. Um, 15 feet is way closer than people think. Yeah. Uh, and then 25 feet, I would say eight. Okay. But yeah, it, it, it all depends on the wind. When, when I think Protoral, I think it's just wind, wind, wind. So <laughs> on the pro tour, I would probably make like six, but any other day it would probably be nine, eight, eight or nine. And then uh, 40 feet, 40 feet, I'd hope to make around five. Okay. Are you a, are you a step putter? Are you a spin putter? What's your, what's your stroke? I, <laughs> my, my, my putt is unique in my opinion i release at the low point of my swing so when my arm is going down i release there instead of at the and my arm will my arm will end like a curve like that okay so i go i go straight down straight up and on the upward momentum i release it so it it's mainly because of my height and my arm length and leg length. I need to utilize all the momentum that my body can, can put into it. So my putt is technically a spin putt and I'm just pushing at the same time. So okay. it's not, it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm lobbing it into the air because of that it, it's still head level direct at it most of the time. So you've mentioned your height a couple times. So for context, so people can know, how tall are you? Five five, and I weigh one hundred and fifteen pounds. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I to me, I love that because I think so often when people are like, they look at the Calvins of the world, they look at the ABs, and they're like, well, no wonder they throw so far. They are gargantuan human beings. Like I'm never going to be able to throw four hundred feet because I am under six feet tall. Uh, right. And here you are throwing 525 foot shots in tournaments at five, five. Uh, so it gives hope for all of our short. I, I do like to say if I was six, three, I'd probably throw 700 feet. <laughs> it, it helps. It helps. I, it I will helps. be the first to agree uh, <laughs> that the lanky, the lanky limbs do help uh, to a certain, if you know how to use them, uh, they can yeah. help to a certain degree. Yeah. Uh, it certainly makes tap-ins easier because my tap-in range is definitely a little longer. Uh, makes but sense. that's beside the point. So uh, our last question uh, for the inter- – like getting to know your game side, Paul, is that uh, what would you say is the biggest strength of your game? Mm, <laughs> that's difficult because usually it's putting. Um, in this past weekend, it was putting, but I've been struggling – more than you can imagine on the putting green. But I would probably say putting, <laughs> even when I'm struggling, um, which, in my opinion, is not good. I'd rather have my tee shots be the strength. I would rather, I would personally rather have a birdie look on every hole and miss 60% of them. Mm. Um Talk, talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, talk us through that 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 mentality. Well, you're with my putting style. I'm almost never going to three putt unless I roll away. Um, so realistically, if I have a birdie look in every hole, I shot a bogey free round, and I birdied, say, six holes, seven holes, and then on a good day, I would birdie twelve holes, thirteen holes. Okay. No bogey. If I was throwing well, but because I don't throw well sometimes, I give myself bogey opportunities, double bogey opportunities. I go out of bounds, and then I put all the pressure on the putt to make hard saves and then long birdie looks. So, in in reality, tee shots are, <laughs> I'll say, way more important than putting. If you don't know how to throw the disc, you're never going to birdie. That's that's fair. That's fair. So that it's, it's interesting because I feel like we often we can push that narrative and I I'm part of the, the ones pushing the narrative and like you hear this phrase, right? Like drive for show, putt for dough type deal. Mm -hmm. Um, But especially like, 
I remember the one pro tour event that I ended up playing because I played a sil- wait, I played MCO when it was the Silver Series, um, and so like I was there and I don't throw far. Like I know I don't throw far, and looking at my putting percentage by the end of the uh, weekend, I was in the top half of the field easily. I was really in the top like twenty five percent of the field in putting, and I came in second to last. <laughs> for exactly what you're saying of like yeah. i my putts were for pars and bogeys and everyone else's putts were for birdies and pars like right and i don't care how yeah. good you are at putting or not if you're putting for a birdie versus putting for a bogey the pressure feels very different oh yeah completely um yeah i i would say just having any opportunity for birdie is is all that matters cuz i I would rather play a birdie free round, but throw good shots and play a bogey free round and you just get 18 cars than to like suck it up in the front nine and then, you know, get, get some shots together and get a few birdies and then shoot even part. So yeah. the other thing is if you're not throwing well, your putt is going to be less confident. And I guess it can go the same way. The other, the other way is if you're not putting well, you're, your driver is going to be less confident because you feel like you need to put it close. But I, I'd say the whole thing is start your round with good drivers and then make a 25 foot putt. And then you're, you're off to the races. Yeah. Now I, I think an interesting part of this is you mentioned for your putt, a three putts pretty much never going to happen. So I do feel like that's an important distinction for folks because especially if you end up playing like local leagues or you play with a lot of ams the amount of times i'll see a three putt happen is shocking uh because it yeah. is okay i have this 25 foot look for a birdie i ran it i ran it way too hard okay now i'm 20 feet past on the other side and i'm a little rattled because now this is my par putt i have to make this oh no you missed the 20 footer and now that next 25 foot putt you're looking at for a birdie you're like what what am I supposed to right. do? Like, how am I supposed yeah. to handle this? So do you feel like work on the drives, focus on the drives, but also it's not ignoring the putting. We're not trying to say like, I don't feel like you're trying to say putting isn't important. It's just a, it can't like, it's very difficult for a, especially unless you're playing a pitch and putt, I would guess it's very yeah. difficult for your putting to really carry around consistently. Correct. I do have one scenario where my putt carried around and I, I putted 509 feet of distance. <laughs> <laughs> through, through seven holes, I had 365 feet of putts. And I was six down through seven with one circle one birdie. So Dude. if you can putt like that, who cares about throwing? Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> But doing that consistently is way harder than throwing consistently. So if you can if you can get your tee shots dialed in and uh, just practice putt consistently, I think I think you'll you'll catch at every pro tour event. Yeah. Me on the other hand, I've been throwing trash. <laughs> I also been I've also been putting trash. So it's been a little difficult, but. I figured my my putt out this past week. So. Okay, well, dude, we're we're looking at uh, we want to look at your bag for a second, and then I want to talk a little bit more about pro tour experience. What's it, what it's like out on the road? Uh, because you honestly, you had a a probably not the start you wanted at all uh, for the pro tour this year, but also some life circumstances came your way that didn't help that process either. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, but before we dive in that, I want to talk about your bag. So currently sponsored by MVP. Uh, yep. But when you won your major title in 2022, I remember I remember so clearly you're on Simon's vlog and you're asking, or he asked you like if you were to get sponsored by someone who it would be, you mentioned Dismania. Uh, yep. And then it was another Simon vlog where they offered like where you would either received it on Simon's vlog or they like... Yeah. Talk us, so you get your first major experience, um, 
and I don't want to like get you in trouble with MVP. So I don't want to talk too much about that side of things, just giving context for people to transition you into, uh, you sign with MVP, you're going the gyro discs, talk us through building, going from open bag to Dismania sponsored to MVP sponsored in really a two year period. I would say, yeah, a uh, three year period. No. Okay. Not two and a half, I'd say. So, yeah, I uh, when I played U.S. Amateurs in 2022 and Amateur Worlds, I was open bag, and I threw almost all this mania. A lot of FDs, I played with the P1X. I, had, yeah, just whatever disc mania disc I could think of. But I also bagged like a Wraith and Metal Flick Destroyers. Those are those are great for um my distance and arm speed and, and shot control that I like. Um, so yeah, just some destroyers, rapes, a metal flake gator. Um, but basically all this mania type molds. And then uh, I don't remember when Simon offered it to me, but we were at Maple Hill. We played a, a uh, doubles golds round. And uh after the round, we went up to the sap house to do the outro, and I'm just used to him trying to find cool spots to do an outro. So I was like, yeah, like, let's go up top. And then he just pulled out a contract out of his bag and offered me a Dismania contract. And uh, I waited about a month before accepting it because <laughs> I wanted to make sure it was right for, for me. Uh, but yeah, and then when I got on Dismania, the, the switch was, it was super simple for me. And then, uh, over this past off season, MVP reached out and we started talking and, uh, I did a lot of, a lot of thinking, <laughs> making sure it was the right thing. Went to Simon's house to, to check out what he had and just, I needed to make sure it was, it was the right thing for me. And then, uh, accepted the offer and. That's when, uh, I don't know, I guess Simon gave me probably 50 discs to try. And then I got maybe like 100 from MVP when I uh, I did research and went on their website and found some discs that I wanted. But the Switch has been a lot easier than you would think. But that's probably because I've only been playing for four legit years. Okay. So I don't have... I don't have perfect muscle memory with all these discs and whatever. So switching was simple. And uh, actually, when I first switched, I'd say 90% of my bag were brand new discs. And I went to go play a local course, like never thrown before. They're, they're just out of the box, brand new. Um, I went to go play a local course, and I beat my course record. <laughs> wow. So. Okay. So gyro is yeah. just better. Uh, that's that's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah, just when, just that good. I would say gyro is the most predictable out of the box. Okay. Like I, I, I can feel I can feel a putter or a mid range, and I'm like, all right, this is gonna do exactly what I exactly what I imagine it to do. Okay. I I've always wondered because like you, when we think about the inconsistency that comes from a lot of the manufacturers, like I think of. Innova is at the top of the list, right? Just because their molds are so old that it's like, if you pick up a destroyer, it's so hard. You and I could walk into a pro shop and both pick up a destroyer that seems to be from the same run and they could fly different just based on, did they cool longer? Like, where was the party line? Whatever that may be. Uh, and I've always wondered with MVP if that, that fact that they have to double mold it if that almost helps the consistency because of the fact that like they have to get these discs moving through so many different processes that it helps make that easier. Um, but amongst the molds, you talk about consistency. Uh, what are some of the molds that we'll start on? We'll start on the negative and we'll move to the positive. How's that sound? What are some molds that uh, you thought, Oh, I'm going to love this. Like for sure. That didn't necessarily gel with you. Uh, instantly the Tesla that okay. was, uh, that was my most looked forward to disc 
and I absolutely suck with it. <laughs> I, I don't know if it, it's, I think it's the rim shape. The, the Wrath and the Tesla are almost the same disc, but the Wrath has a flatter top and not as deep of a rim versus the Tesla has a deeper rim, bit more um, severe wing. And then the the top almost kind of like it like rounds to the flat. Okay. And for some reason, I I grip lock that disc, and then when I'm scared of grip locking it, I'll already release that disc, and then I I can't forehand it. Okay. Um, which here I, I have a putter with me. When I forehand, all that matters is this knuckle is sitting on it, whereas some discs it'll be like that. Okay. And that that's how I can determine if it's a good forehand disc or not. And the Tesla sips like it's, it's a bad forehand disc. Okay. So uh yeah, the Tesla is the big the big one for me. Because I, I thought I was gonna love it. But with that being said, the wrath has been fantastic. <laughs> so uh and then the other the other one would probably be the time lapse. Because I have small hands, like Probably the smallest you'll see on tour or really anywhere. Just, <laughs> just, just think of a, just think of a, like an eight-year-old hand, eight-year-old boy. Like that. That's kind of that's kind of how small my hand is. Oh. And uh, that you would think that I would want to to bag a a twelve speed. Uh, is that, I don't know, that's kind of the smallest and fastest grip disc you can throw. Yeah. But for some reason, I can't really can't really grip it too well. Um, yeah. Uh, the hex, I bagged the hex for the beginning of the year, but found okay. that I don't like it compared, I, I like it, but not as much compared to the Matrix. Okay. Okay. Oh. That's, the the hex was one of the discs that I was going to ask about uh, because I feel like if you go across most manufacturers, there is a mold that I feel like always gets sold incorrectly to the people. So the hex, I feel like people describe the hex as if it's going to be this like perfectly straight, uh, even a little bit of easy turn disc like if that's what you're looking for oh when i throw my hex i just i yam on it and you'll find you'll find an ma3 player that tries to describe their hex that way and it may be because they've seasoned it whatever it may be uh but the matrix i would not think of the matrix as being a quote neutral disc like i would think of the matrix yeah. having a little more stability uh than that so it's interesting that you compare it to the hex so how did that comparison come about? Well, when I throw mid ranges, I like them to be uh, noticeably different compared to my fairways. I don't like when I, I bag this. I don't like having that like two hundred and fifty foot disc, two hundred or three hundred seventy five foot disc, three hundred foot disc. Like I'd rather have it be two fifty, three fifty, and then I work. The 350 down and i work the 250 up okay um which is why the other another just that i am surprised actually no i'm not surprised that i didn't like it but most people are surprised is the envy um i can't throw the envy to save my life but at the same time i don't want to because okay. i when i bag throwing putters i only bag one for the most part and that throwing putter has to do everything for me. Um, uh, before Dismania and when I was on Dismania, it was the tactic. So I, li I only bagged one tactic. And uh, it was an extra hard tactic. It could Anheuser, go straight, Heiser, Heiser flip, Heiser flip turn, forehand, everything. So that that's kind of how I built my putter game. Um. Yeah, so I, I, with that thought, it has to be a little different with MVP because they don't have a, um, they don't have a baseline tempo yet. Okay. So the tempo has a bit too much stability for that. So yeah. I also bag a lot 
uh, for the turnovers. Okay. But I would say, uh, what thought were we on? The matrix versus X? Yeah, matrix versus X, yeah. the comparison. So I, the, with that, uh, I like having a bit more of a difference with, compared to mids and fairways. So the matrix doesn't go as far as the hex. And um, it has a bit more reliable fade for me. Okay. Uh, the hex could get away from me if, if I'm trying to throw like a straight to hyzer with a mid range. Yeah. So I, I like the matrix. It kind of fit my distance slot a bit better for mid range yeah. shots. That's that's fascinating, and I I think that makes sense in terms of the I I love the I need to have a distinction between the two of them because it makes decision making easier on the course. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of people bag the hex because it goes so far. Uh, like I'll never forget the first time that I remember seeing a hex fly in person uh, was Hunter from Foundation. He brought it to Creators Cup, four hundred and like eight foot hole. And this dude grabs his hex and just pumps it all the way down, puts it in the circle. Yeah. And like Brody was like, yeah, it's just a simple mid. And I was like, Brody, none of my mids do that. Uh, like, <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you, dude. Uh, like that's insane. Uh, the hex does it. Right? Like it's so good. Uh, but I could see that you want the distinction between the two of them. So talking about like that shot shaping in terms of like having your mids kind of do all of it. Do you just have seasoned matrixes, matrix, uh, matrixes? Uh, I don't know what the plural of matrix is, uh, Neo. But you flip, like, if you're trying to go all the way over, do you jump to, like, a detour or something like that for the understable side of your mids? Or you just um, don't have something I, over there? I have a um, patent pending matrix, and it's surprisingly flippy. Okay. But it rarely gets thrown. I... The thing you'll learn about my game is I'll, I'll throw one disc on almost anything. So my main mid-range is a uh, Cosmic Neutron Matrix, and they're the most overstable run of them. Um, but if I want to throw a turnover, I'll, I'll throw that turnover with that Matrix. It's stable. Okay. But at the same time, I beg two Matrixes. There's an overstable one and an understable one. Whatever the shot calls for, uh, I'll throw. But for the most part, it'll be the over silver one. Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll tri- we'll go to. You mentioned the wrath uh, as one. So on the positive side, what are some molds that you didn't expect to be so reliable for you, but ended up working out? I'm guessing the matrix also slots into there. I would say the matrix, um, the tempo definitely. I knew I was gonna. I knew I was gonna throw it because when I got my first when I got my first uh, tempo, I aced with it the first week. Uh, Come on! So, Come on! Yeah, actually, the first week that I threw MVP, um, I aced with it, and I, I couldn't promote it because I couldn't I didn't I wasn't able to announce the MVP signing yet. <laughs> so, I, Secret I aces. Aced, right. I I aced. Um, the first week and then the next week I aced again. <laughs> so the tempo was like, it was an immediate yes for me. Actually, okay. I love that. I, I compare it to a zone, but it's sharper and it's, it's still a four speed, but it's sharper. So it goes farther. Okay. So, okay. Hey, shout out Thomas Gilbert. He was looking for a farther flying zone and I showed him the tempo and he loved it. So, okay. I I would say if you're looking for a far for a far the flying zone, try the tempo, especially the uh, soft proton one. Okay, that was the most recent OTB drop. Yeah, yeah. Okay, dude, I love it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, the Paul Cran's signature tempo. That's uh, that's I, that's uh, the dream. I'll, I'll cry if it doesn't happen. <laughs> okay. Okay. Don't make him cry, <laughs> MVP. Let's not make him cry. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll, uh, the other surprising one was a crave, which is interesting. Surprising, but I uh, I thought I was gonna bag servos. I don't know why I I tried them once and then never tried them again. It's not that I didn't like them, but then I found um, cosmic neutron craves and they're 
surprisingly overstable. Okay. And, uh, wait, no, actually, I got my fundraiser disc, and I got them on Eclipse Crave, so I was like, oh, yeah, I got to try the Crave now. So I threw mine, and it was like, mine, were, mine are pretty understable. Like, I'll hide and flip to turn them, and uh, I kind of liked it. So I was like, you know what, let's try another Crave. Let's see how, uh, let's see how the Crave, uh, the Crave thirst. So I, I, the only other one that I had was a Cosmic Duke Run, and it's overstable, and I absolutely love it. Um, so if you have any Cosmic Duke Run Craves that are overstable, <laughs> hit me up. I only have two. Um, yeah, so the Crave is, is surprising, but at the same time, it's not because it's such a good disc. If you're looking for that, I mean, it, it literally flies and lands like a mid range but goes as far as a fairway. So, great for wooded holes and tight shots and everything. Yeah. Dude, uh, the Crave the crave is uh, one of our things. So, our community, uh, we have, for those that listen, um, we have this website called Disc RPM uh, where you can, um, it's kind of like, uh, have you ever heard of the website My Disc Bag? Uh, mm-hmm where people input it. So this RPM kind of took that concept and improved on it in a major way. Uh, so they have, they have these like communities you can build. So we have an in the bag community uh, has 1,481 people in it. Uh, and one of my favorite things is you can literally search like by a disc name. And so I can type crave and I can see, how many people have a crave in their bag and amongst our community, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have over 320 people in our community who have <laughs> a crave in their bag, which is sick. Uh, that's, so, that's a good choice. Come on with it. Uh, yeah. Now on the other side, let's see, I'm going to type wrath. A few less. Uh, there are less than 20 people who have a rat yeah. in their back. So it sounds like people are missing out. Right. Um, okay. So, well, Paul, we want to talk uh, on the last half of this. I don't want to take too much of your time, sir. So I want to guys appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, I know you got an off week right now. Uh, jumping back in at Preserve. But uh, they looking at your start to the year. So uh, I'm going to rattle off some places here. Uh, your first cash was you took 40th at at Austin uh, and cashed. Um, and then uh, next cash was the Q Series uh, 303 Open. Uh, if we're talking like Pro Tour put on events, I guess. Q Series feels like a, yeah. a question, like, you know, like a... It's like a silver, silver Series. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, but then, so not the not the start that you're looking for. When you look back at the first half of the year, because I really do feel like we're at about the halfway point, maybe a little yep. over half. Uh, what do you feel like was the disconnect heading into the first half of the year? Because I'm sure it's not the performances you were looking for. Well, I had a long, long talk with my uncle. Um, on the way to Illinois the past weekend and kind of broke it down a little and gave myself some perspective in my mind. It's not the excuse, but I think deep down it is, uh, my life completely changed. <laughs> like the longest I've been away from home before leaving for tour was two weeks. And that was one week before I left for tour. Wow. So I was gone two weeks and then I was home a week and then I left for Thor and I haven't, I haven't been back home since February 15th. So it's been, it's been a few, a few months and uh, I have seen my parents a few times, but at the same time, it's like we were talking and the disconnect is probably I'm just settling in without realizing. It. Like, I feel like this is a lifestyle for me. And I'm totally happy. I'm not, I'm not homesick or anything. But at the same time, I've spent 19 years of my life at home with family. Every tournament, I would drive to the tournament, play the tournament, drive home, sleep. And then if there was a two-round tournament, 
or uh, two day tournament, three day tournament, it would be the same thing. I'd only be a home, I'd only be away from home for for four or five days at most. And um, most of my practice is in my backyard listening to music, and uh, I don't have I don't have that consistent place to go back to every week to practice. So I'd say the disconnect deep down is my life is is changing. And uh, I had this conversation with him three days before this past weekend that I, I won an A tier in Illinois. And it kind of like made me think even more. I'm like, maybe I just needed to to accept the fact that I I am completely changed in in what I do every single day, and nothing is consistent. And um, yeah, so I I'd say I'd say I uh, I kind of clicked with that thought, and it it like took a almost a burden off my shoulders in a way. So mm. I would say definitely that, but at the same time, I've had so many other things going on this year that it's like distracted me from true practice. Yeah. So. Yeah. The, I, I feel like I, because so I, I, I once I will never diminish the the skill level of the pros that are out there. The people are very good on the pro tour. Very very good. They are the like you take most of your local pros and your local pros and the distance between you to them as an amateur to your local pro is still for most for most people that's the distance between the local pro to the top guys on the tour. Like it's crazy how good, how skilled the tour is. And as it continues to develop, um, and someone asked me once, like, Robbie, would you ever, would you ever consider like dropping everything, putting your like nose to the grindstone and like trying to push to go make it on tour one day, taking like a bonanza type route. And I just know what you're talking about, Paul, of that, like your life has to change. I know that is not a lifestyle that suits me. I love my routines. I love that every Tuesday night I'm going to this Domino's. I'm picking up my pizza. I'm coming home and I'm watching some YouTube. Like I love the Thursdays. I go to Buffalo Wild Wings. I know like I'm on Mondays. I go to like, I love my routines. So I think that that's definitely something to acknowledge. Uh, and also the, even if you were playing, let's say you were playing a tiers every weekend in your upper, like in your area, you're probably still not even when it comes to playing those A tiers, you're probably still not showing up on Monday for that A tier, practicing it all week, playing the event, turning around, driving. Like it's just a, it's a vastly different lifestyle. Uh, but take us to this weekend. You've mentioned this weekend a couple of times. You played the Rumble Pro Divisions 2024 in Illinois and you come out with the dub. And it's not like when you got to this event that it was, oh, well, Paul Kranz, the touring player, is here and no one else, like there's no other tour car holders here. Yeah. Tony Moe was there. Callaway was there. Uh, there was definitely some competition, for sure. Uh, yeah. So walk us through, you're playing, a, you're playing an A tier. Did it feel, did you feel less pressure not being on a pro tour event? walking into this uh no so <laughs> this that week was um interesting for me because all year all right, let me let me try to explain this so i have not gotten i have not been nervous almost at all this year uh, stepping up to whole ones not nervous i don't have any butterflies in my stomach i i don't know it's just not like clicking with me um it's not that i lost passion for it it's just I don't think I realize what I'm doing sometimes, like where I'm at in life. Um, so I haven't gotten nervous at all. Yeah. Um, and then this week, driving to Illinois on Tuesday, I kind of just sat there and I thought about the tournament and I realized I could win this. I can, I can perform well. This, this, is, this is where I'm going to turn my week around. And I instantly got butterflies in my stomach. I wasn't even like, I was still three days away from round one and I was just sitting there like queasy stomach legs were legs huh. were, uh, 
were like getting uh what is it tired and I, I could like if I tried to stand they would almost be like I can't like I, I my legs would give out um so I, I got nervous for the first time just thinking about the event and then day one stepped up to hole one and I'm just I'm kind of like shaking like my my hand my hands are shaking and I, I have the the adrenaline and, and the nerves for the first time all year and uh I think that's what I needed because when I have, when I'm nervous, my, my brain and body flick a bit better and mm. I, I throw harder, I throw straighter, I throw just all around more accurately. And it, it, it showed, I mean, whole one, I started out with a 45 foot birdie putt and I don't think I've, I can only think of a few events where I start out with a birdie hole one this year. So okay. Yeah, the, the the mindset definitely kind of definitely changed compared to the rest of the year. Which you would think that I would get nervous at pro tour events, but I have yet to uh, have yet to get nervous. Um, so that that was the biggest thing was was nerves, and that fired me up. Totally, totally gave me motivation to to perform well in, in the round. Dude, that's awesome. It like I. I feel like so many players run from those butterflies of like, I need to calm down. I need to feel good. And it's like, as you, like you're saying, sometimes it's not, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, so round one, you come out in third place, uh, solo third, you're two strokes back in the lead. Uh, Ben Calloway and Austin Bates, both shoot a 14. You shoot a 12. You catch them the next round. You shoot a nine. Calloway shoots a seven. So you're t all tied up paying into the last round. Now, looking at it, you only have two bogeys this entire event. That's honestly, that's so sick. Uh, I was talking to an MA3 player about this uh, a couple days ago, and we were just talking about bogeys and things like that. And it was like when I heard a pro describe a bogey as moving backwards, that changed pars for me because it was like, you know what, pars on certain courses, pars hurt, but at least you're not truly moving backwards. Like it's going to take me two holes now to sort of get that stroke back. Um, so you go into round three, you're tied for the lead. You had walked into this event telling yourself, hey, I have the chance to play for the win here. What's going through your mind heading into round three? Uh that I'm gonna win. <laughs> I told myself more. I told myself multiple times I'm gonna come out a champion. Uh, whether that's through a learning experience or performing well. It. I. I, I stayed at Ben Calloway's house the night before. We had burgers and hot dogs, and uh, Andrew Fish was there too. I actually recorded a podcast with him, and uh, I told Ben, I'm like, I don't. I don't care who wins. Like, I just want us to have, I just want us to have that experience of like competition. I don't want one of us to run away with it. I don't want, I, I, I seriously, like I wanted to win, but at the same time, all I cared about was the experience coming out of it. And, uh, like maybe later in the year after I've had good performances, I, I'd have a different mindset. I'd be like, yeah, I want to win nothing else. But I think this, having such a poor start to my season, all I needed was the confirmation of three good rounds in a row. Oh. And, um, yeah, so going into it, I was like, right, I'm going to be a champion. No matter what, have, have that mindset of, uh, have that, have that good mindset. You're not going to get mad. You're, you're going to learn from through, through all the, through all the shots that you throw and, uh, started out hole one and I birdied, took the lead right away. One stroke. And, uh, I did not lose the lead at all for the rest of the round. Come on. So, yeah, I uh, started out well. Um, hole six, in, in as an example, was uh, R four, but it's reachable. But just okay. imagine like a tight, tight fairway, dog leg left, and the basket is on a side slope that's literally like that angle, Oof. and the basket is, basket is here, so it just keeps running away. I threw a bad tee shot an amazing approach shot to 55 feet 50 feet short of the basket so i was putting straight downhill and uh 
walking up to the putt, or before walking up to the putt, Ben said, yeah, I think he landed to about 70 feet. And I was like, all right, I get an easy bar after that tough scramble. But I saw that I was uh, 50 feet away. Walking up to the putt, I, I was like, all right, you know what? I told myself I'm going to be a champion. I will be a champion. I don't care. I'm not laying this up, no matter how scary it is. And, uh, yeah, I, I stepped up the putt with that mindset of, like, I will do it. I can do it. And uh, just made the putt dead center. And that was kind of, like, the point of, like, all right, today, today I, I'm capitalizing on things. So, the only, the only putt I missed all day was a 35 foot putt, and that was a hole before. I, I missed a putt the hole before, and uh, right after that, took took got took that um that that low and made it a high right away. So, dude, yeah, so my, did you? The mindset was uh was I I'm, I got this all day. Did you big butt bid, bid on that hole? Because I'm seeing on I hole did. six. You yeah, like you get the birdie. He took a par. Uh, yeah, he he. I think he missed a twenty foot putt. Oh, oh, cuts to the cuts to the soul. It, good, well, it's good to know that it, it happens to the pros too. <laughs> it, it hurt me to watch. Um. Okay. So you you have the you have the lead. So let's see. I'm gonna do the math real fast. So you're up one. You're up two. You're up one. You're up two. Do 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 do. You're up three. You're up three with one, two, three, four. Yeah, up three with four holes to go. Is that sounding about right? Yep. Yeah, so hole 15, 255 feet. This hole, Ben has a video of this hole, so it's the only reason that I like I, I get to see the holes because he has a video of this. Yeah. Downhill, it looked tight on camera. So that means I can only imagine this hole has to be like treacherously tight. Yeah. Uh, talk us through your drive because you've got the box and then what Ben does. Well, I'll, I'll start the hole before. The hole before okay. is, a, is a bonus birdie. It's kind of like a really awkward uphill, nose up forehand uh, with a fireball, a nine speed. So it's, it, in my mind, it's probably the bonus birdie of the course, even though it's probably only 280 feet, 250. Um, it's just very difficult. Stepping up to the hole, I had the box, and I was like, if I birdie this, I'm going to win. It, it, I have I have two strokes. If I birdie it, I'll most likely have three strokes. Um, and I ended up putting it under the basket, and I was like, all right. <laughs> Three starts with, with four holes to go. Obviously, I can lose, but with how I've been playing, I was like, there, there's almost no chance that I'm losing this. So, step up to the next hole. I, uh, I grab a tempo backhand. I've been working a fan grip, actually, and I've been loving it all week, mainly because my finger been injured. But then, then throwing fan grip, and uh, I throw it fantastic. But the wind picks up and kind of tips it to – a little bit too flat. If it was this, the hyzer that it was on, I would have gotten a perfect uh, Annie skip to circle one, but I hit the ground flat and uh, landed about 55 feet short. So then Ben steps up and uh, yeah, he <laughs> performs his magic. I believe he was throwing a really unstable roach, baseline roach. And uh, when I saw him step into the tee with that disc, I was like, holy cow, this shot is about to be so cool. Because it needs to be like extreme highs or flip to straight to slow turn and drop. And uh, he throws it out of his hand, looks so, so perfect. And I just see it slowly start turning, hits dead center chains, and he aces. Oh. Yeah. So, <laughs> so he aces. Is there any moment where you're like, I'm going to run the putt? Or are you just like, okay. I can't run this putt? Yeah, no, I, I've. I tried running the putt. It was, I was right. There were trees right in front of the basket, and I was like 50 feet back. So I had to get on a knee, straddle out to the right, and my my body weight was on the low side, so it's a lot harder to generate the power. So my my whole mindset was to run it, but it ended up just being a layup. 
didn't really uh, commit to it enough. Yeah. So you end up, he gets two strokes on you there. So he's got one stroke, three to play. What's, was there, yeah, what's going through your head after a moment like that happens? I, I went over to a couple of friends and I just smiled at them. I was like, well, what can you do? There's <laughs> nothing you can do. And uh, they were like, all right, just, you got this, focus up and grab, grab the matrix. Next hole, Ben Parks. Well, first of all, Ben Parks, which is his box. And then uh, the other two guys birdied the hole before, so I had to watch them throw two, and they they all parked it too, I believe. No, one guy missed. He he threw it about thirty feet, but the other two, the other guy parked it. And uh, yeah, so I uh, step up to the hole after watching three pure shots, and it's kind of a tight tight shot. So I uh, grabbed my matrix and was like, you know, what? just commit. All right, threw it. Put it. I think I threw it to about 15 feet. So, but with that being said, I was the most nervous I've ever been in that situation. In, in that, uh, in that time, I was, I was literally like shaking, could barely stand. I did a squat before I threw to try to get some blood flow to my legs. Um, it felt unbelievably queasy. And from my experience, I throw things harder like that. Okay. Um, so I aimed farther left than I normally do. And in return, I actually fair blocked it a bit and threw it right down the middle. So my decision making was pretty spot on in that moment, but we ended up birding that hole. And then the next hole birdied. Um, I had a 25 foot putt for birdie. And I, uh, I did the classic gain and burr of you put it and then bring your arm immediately down. I jolted my arm pretty hard. So, yeah, we, we birded that hole, and I had one shirt going into the final hole. And it's a, it's a pretty obvious forehand hyzer, probably about, I'd say, 325, 350. Um, and I'm not too sure why, but I think Ben didn't throw a single forehand before that hole. All, all tournament, or sorry, all all round, and then he stepped up with forehand. So in my mind, I was like, "All right, I I don't see this being parked." So he he threw it about forty five feet long, um, and had almost no look at it. He the only look that he had was a forehand run at it. Um. So once he threw that, I I felt a bit more comfortable. But I made the same mistake as him, and I threw it sixty feet long in the bush, and. I, I had to lay up. So then I watched him throw a forehand, like line up a forehand for 20 seconds. And I was so nervous that he was going to make it. He ended up missing. Um, yeah. So that was my first bogey free round of the year as well. Uh, dude, electric to bogey free round when it counts the most. Um, so as my final question, to wrap it up, because I want to say once again, thanks, Paul, for coming on. I really appreciate you, man. Uh, and uh, the looking at it, what does what does a win like this inspire you for the rest of the season? It proved myself that I can play three good rounds and perform well under pressure, and it it showed me that I can still get nervous again. Uh, and that's good. Is that I'm thinking about preserve in three weeks, four weeks, and I'm, I, I'm nervous right now. <laughs> so I uh, definitely clicked with a lot of things in, in mindset and life and, and whatever. So I'm excited. I have a week off, and then next week is Kansas City Flying Discs, which I'm playing against uh, – Kale Visca and Levi Hancock. So not not the biggest field, but it'll be similar to this past weekend. Yeah. Dude, that's epic. Uh okay, so true final question. Uh I we've talked about this. Uh you're a foundation a foundation fan. Uh <laughs> like enjoy enjoy the videos. So give the guys the sales pitch. <laughs> Why are you going to be more fun to have on the to have on content? Because you're going to be in their neighborhood for worlds. Uh, 
I'm looking forward to. Hopefully, you and I can film a video together because I'll be up there for Worlds as well. I'm getting up. Yeah, of course. I'll be there the Wednesday before Worlds start. So maybe you and I, we can play a little. Uh, we'll play something easy. We'll play a little yeah. pigeon putt and uh, have a good time. Uh, run some bad. aces. So uh, give me, give us the sales pitch. Why, why Paul Kranz needs to be on foundation content, especially um, over that German guy. <laughs> I, I foundation itself is probably my favorite YouTube channel ever. <laughs> I, I love, I love their content and uh, I'm sponsored by this. So I, I can't like, them up too much but uh, <laughs> you know, i i love watching their channel their challenges are my favorite entertainment i like i compare them to simon Jenkins, where it's like so entertaining that you're just gonna watch it undistracted mm. um and it's always been a dream of mine to to be on a foundation video i've been watching their videos since i started playing so five years okay and I've watched nearly every single video. Dude. Uh, yeah, so any, any sort of challenge I'd I'd love to I'd love to do. Okay. We'll get you uh we'll see what we can do. Make it happen. Uh so Paul, dude, I appreciate you, man. Uh wanna give you a little a little spot here. Shout out the sponsors, plug it all, do your thing. Okay. Uh start out with this golf nine seven eight. They're uh, my local retail shop out of Sterling, Massachusetts, and uh I describe them as the best family to be part of. They they run basically the entire New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, like that area um, scene for disc golf. Every tournament has their their name on it, and they, they support so much. Last year, I think they ran like twenty five tournaments in the area, so maybe even more than that. But they uh, definitely major support for me. Just with everything. And then, uh, Sunstein, they, uh, they're helping me out this year with, with some travel costs and everything. So if you need a lawsuit taken care of or something, hit them up. They, uh, they it. also, they also know disc golf well. So, uh, and then MVP, obviously they, uh, took a big, big chance on me this year, but at the same time, I don't, I, I'm happy to prove that it's not a big chance. They made the right choice. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, have them as a sponsor this year. And uh, yeah, my uh, social medias are paul.crans on Instagram and Paul Crans on Facebook and then Paul Crans Disc Golf on YouTube. So, Dude, it's incredible. Well, Paul, we appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Thank and, you. Uh, Looking forward to uh, hanging out at Worlds. It'll be a good time. Yes, good luck sir. at Preserve. Uh, yeah, and we'll see you in a couple of months. Sweet. Thank you. Bang. There we go. Well, y'all, I this is going to be a little bit of, of a longer episode for sure because I when I get to talk to cool people, I love just getting to have a conversation. And then I look down and I'm like, oh, we've been going for an hour, Paul. Uh, that's my bad. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Be sure to go support Paul. Paul Kranz, it's P-A-U-L, just like you would expect Paul. And then Kranz is K-R-A-N-S. So Paul dot Kranz. Uh, go check him out. Go support him over there. I uh, want to say thankful, thank you to Paul for coming on, taking time out of his day. He's on an off week and he's still doing business uh, here with us recording. So looking forward to that content. Let us know what challenge should we do with Paul while he's in town uh not only what else, what challenge should i do with paul on my channel but also like what should foundation uh try to do with paul uh and have a good time with that so but brad not being here because you know once again just a push reminder go check him out happy birthday happy birthday shoot those messages uh but we have to find out what's new in the warehouse what's going on so i'm gonna do my best interpretation of this because i actually forgot to even text brad to be like yo abb what should i be like what's new in the warehouse so thankfully jason uh got it got us hooked up so here are some things that are new 
inside of the warehouse this week. They're dropping. They'll have dropped two hours ago, so you want to go check them out. We have Kristen Tatar, 1,000 Rated Graces, Kristen Tatar, St. Pros, Kristen Tatar, Claymores, and the new jury, uh, the jury putter. I think it's a 2302. Uh, one of the best things about putters is that if you have not found a putter that works for you where you're like, I just feel like I don't get consistent releases on my putt. I feel like I don't get consistent releases uh, when I'm throwing the putter, it's always nice to be able to go out and find new putters and test them out. And thanks to foundation care, you could test out the jury to find out is the jury, the putter that you've been missing your entire disc golf career. The reason that you haven't been able to make putts jury's out. You need a different putter. You can go test out the jury. And if it doesn't work for you, thanks to foundation care. You have 30 days to test it out and check it out, see if it works. And if not, you can always trade it back in uh, and get an envy, get something else that matches uh, something that you know you're going to love. All you got to do, there's a form at the bottom of foundationdisc.com for you to check out. Fill that out, and we'll send you a shipping label. Super, super cool. But all the Kristen Tatar stuff, 1,000 rated, guys. It's so sick, so awesome that we have a 1,000 rated FBO player out there in the field. Stoked for Kristen. These graces are gorgeous. So gorgeous. Definitely want to check them out. The Saint Pro, another fantastic disc. And the Claymore, definitely a slept on mid range. But not only that, we sh we also have Lone Star going up on the website. There's a big push right now for Lone Star to be up on the website. We've got Mockingbirds. If you remember, before Hunter put the Robbie C. It in his bag, he had the Mockingbird that he was throwing. Great roller option. We have the Armadillo, fantastic one speed that is straight flyer, thumb track on top, glidey lid-like disc. The Curl, hey girl, uh, how you doing? The curl, for those of you who have had a wraith described to you, so here's the progression, right? You have people describe a wraith as an easy to throw destroyer, but for lots of people, the wraith is still not easy to throw. The curl is an easy to throw wraith, at least in my opinion. So really great option. The dome, understable fairway driver. You have the Guadalupe that complements the dome because the, the loop uh, is a super overstable. Um the Lone Wolf, fantastic neutral straight flyer. The Penny Putter, the Tombstone, the Warbird, and the Yellow Rose. The Yellow Rose, I'll go ahead and admit, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the Yellow Rose, so it must be a newer mold that's out there. Definitely go check it out. we got Lone Star coming up on the website. I will tell you, you know, a little, little confessional because it's just me. So I'm getting a little spicy. I personally, I, I know that Hunter said that he believes that Supreme Plastic from Trilogy is his favorite feeling plastic on the market right now. And I will tell you that if you like a soft premium putter, or not putter, sorry, if you like a soft premium plastic, Bravo Plastic by Lone Star Discs is one of the best feeling plastics that I've ever felt. And I would easily put it in my top three favorite plastics out on the market right now. All right, here we go. Liam, away from the, for those of you who are not visual watchers, you can tell by the tone shift. We just got real close to the camera. It was a moment that we had. If you want to dive in, just check it out in the later part of the, later part of the episode. So uh, <coughs> not only that, but we're hoping to get some gateway up on the website as well. We've got a big gateway restock coming as well as AGL. AGL is above ground level discs uh, manufactured by gateway. Really cool mold opportunities that come from that. So just running through, a lot of you know we put some Wizards up on stock. Uh, obviously, I'm a big fan of the Wizard. Connor's a big fan of the Wizard. The Zard Gang, holding strong. But we wanted to get some more Gateway molds uh, and AGL molds out there. And we have some very classic ones uh, that are just fantastic for you to check out the Gateway lineup. I feel like everyone looks at Gateway for their putters and sleeps on some of the other mold options that they have. So from AGL, we have the Baobab. We have the Acacia, which is a new putter that they have. Um, Baobab, super overstable, really fun. Uh, if you want the Zone OS with the thumb track, the Baobab is for you. Uh, the Journey, the Shaman, the Spear. The Spear, I know Jason has been loving the Spear lately. Uh, the Spear, uh, very Jackalope replacement-esque. 
Uh, so if you if you like the jackalope, you want a little bit of flight, but you want a little different hand feel, the spear could be great for you. Uh, the Mystic, the Spirit, the Stego by RDG, Reptilian Discs, the Stego. I mean, if you're looking for a way to just like have a good time, Stego's there. The Spell, the Devil Hawk, the Warlock, and the Wizard, of course. So Gateway, we may not have all of those molds up by Friday uh, or when this video is dropping. The priorities, we're trying to get those load star up, but uh, that that gateway is here in the warehouse, so we are excited to get that out to you. So hope you guys check it out, foundationdisc.com. Remember, foundation care free included with every order on foundationdisc.com. So super sick. Hope you guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We miss you, Brad. We're excited to have you back next week. Happy birthday, brother. Hope it was a phenomenal one. But for everyone else, you're going to go out there. You're going to try these discs. You're going to do what Paul said. You're going to go try the Crave. You haven't checked out the Crave before. You're not one of the 320 in disc RPM who are using it. And you're like, wow, this is incredible. And we remember, if it's good, you keep it in the back. We'll see you guys next week.